Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I was actually here yesterday too and, and watching um, the, the speaker and um, I noticed it gets very quiet back where you are. So um, if during the talk, if you want to ask a question, that would be great. In fact, if everybody asked one question during the talk, that would be great. You know, you could, maybe you're shy, you could ask, um, what's my favorite color? And then work into content, you know, gradually. But um, um, that would be great for me because I don't know what you know. That's, a big, that's my big handicap. And so um, if you don't tell me, if you don't interrupt me with something, then I might just go on and on in that academic sense and, and, and just, just hoping that you're understanding. But if you, you know, if, if you put a question like, that's hopelessly unclear, you have to say, you know, you do something. That helps, that helps me a, a, a lot. The other thing is that, um, I guess why Andreas uh, uh, stole and announcing the title was when I, um, when I came yesterday, I realized that um, you know, we have two or three hours together and my talk was um, 30 minutes long. So I, I, I thought if, and also the other thing is I thought it's gonna be a shock. So I thought I'd ease you into it by putting a little header that, that, of course, I went through because I did some research that caused me to think this way and then it helped me with the motor control. And so you haven't had that. So I thought you'd give me, I'd give you, try to give you the same help that I had by telling you something about um, the sort of eye movement system I started working with was this basically gaze control. So the, everybody, when you start out thinking about eye movements, they all tell you, oh, it's completely different than the rest of the motor system because there's no inertia and you have these ballistic movements and it's special. And in, 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 in truth, it is special in those ways, but, but in thinking about the motor control, um, what I'm gonna to try to do is tell you a, a very different way of thinking about motor control system. <laughs> it's gonna be a little, start looking a little more like eye movements. It's going to be look. The movements are going to be sort of um, ballistic in a way. So this is preparation. Okay. So are you ready? Oh, okay. Let's do it. Just shout it out. I mean, don't be shy. Um, you know, I'm stranded up here all alone. Okay. Oh, Texas. Um, Texas is two years of drought, but before that, it has a lot of water, and it's actually a very beautiful place. Okay, so eye gaze, um, just to set the stage, we really want to talk about modules, but to set the stage, the question is, one question that bothers people is, where do you look when you move your eyes around? I think um, pretty uh, people in the audience, I take it, are rather sophisticated, right, in, in eye gaze, so you know about the f primate fovea? Human fovea is a degree at arm's length, and you know the resolution inside the fovea is 100 times the periphery, and so it's important to move that fovea around, and you do it in about three times a second, and it varies under different circumstances. So everybody, I take it, knows that already. But the question is, if you have this restricted um, fovea, where are you looking? And one idea um, that came up, uh, that started with the original paper by Coke and Alman, 85, is that it's about salience. So as I look around, there's um, you know, faces, they're very salient, and so I'll, if I have an image, I'll get an image operator, and, and I'll, 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 I'll get those places, and there's where I look. But um, the emergent, despite the fact that um, people won't stop writing about salience, um, the emergent in the computer um, um, modeling part, the emergent evidence uh, is that it's all about task agenda. So when you move your eyes around, you really, every time you fixate on something, you've already decided what, why you're looking there. And when you get there, you do the job that you were about to do. So that's what uh, we'll talk about. And then um, the issue is multitasking um, that we'll, we'll tackle. So if you have lots of things to do, and you're, they, every, every, each one of those things wants the eye movement system, what is, what, what's, what's a protocol for deciding who gets it? So then the model um, introduces modules that'll be helpful when thinking about the motor system too, is that when you, um, for vision, when you um, are doing these things, you can um, have multiple mo um, tasks alive at the same time. 
So here is, just to get you going, um, ooh, I'm thinking, I'm wondering if we have a laser pointer? Or? Of course we do. Oh, then I'm wondering if I could use it. <laughs> But here, here's, um, this is John Satso's um, work, and it's fairly recent. And the, here's the, an idea of what, what, how the research um, goes. How many, has anybody seen these, I wonder? Huh? The picture. These specific pictures, or? No, something like this, I guess. How about that? OK. Um, OK. Green button in the middle. Green button in the middle. Oh, oh, wow. It's good. OK. Yeah, it's very nice. OK. Um, so here we go. Here's, here's the standard picture. So here's human data. So humans are looking at this, and you record where their eye moons went, and then you make a histogram and, the, and, and pseudocolor it. And here's where they're looking for this image. And here's down here more humans. And then up here is the computer models. And you can see why these papers get published is they're, uh, and they look pretty good because two things here and sort of two things here and stuff here and sort of stuff here. And people decide, OK, you're over threshold, you're in. But then if we take a closer look at the data, we can see that um, for the traffic, I like the traffic. So here's the car. And the people, they want to know who's in the car. Right? Who is in the car? But what does the computer want to know? The wheels. Very exciting. And with features, you know, things spinning around, uh, you can really preoccupy yourself with looking at that if you're a computer. This is my favorite one, this one, little one. So this is, here's a black thing, little kind of a worm craw crawling across the stream. And the, 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 um, the computer, of course, thinks that's rather interesting there. And it's, of course, it's a traffic light. Right, so why, why are the people ignoring it? Because the, the actual lights are facing in the other direction, right? But the com computer doesn't quite have the concept of direction and traffic lights, so off you go. And then, then, of course, up here, you know, buildings and trees are very exciting for the computer, but, um, you know, being primates, we're on the lookout for other primates, and so we're constantly um, looking where um, people might be. So let's give you an idea of the differences. So. Um, so it's all about tasks, and one of, the, um, one of the early works on tasks is Mike Land's work with cricket, um, this boring um, British game that goes on forever. But um, if you're the batter, it's kind of fun to play because you're, you, you get to do something. Um, but the, the, the bowler bounces the ball. He, 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 or, he or she has to bounce the ball in front of you. So all the pitches bounce on the mat in front. So what happens is, um, and it comes incredibly fast, and so here's the ball coming at the bounce point, and the, the batter um, makes one of these fast saccades to where he or she thinks the ball's going to bounce, and then waits there for the ball to come. And the best batters, um, they are just a little quicker. They're about 50 to 100 milliseconds quicker in getting to the bounce point. But the point is, the ball's, are, the ball's coming on a continuous trajectory. The eyes go boom to the bounce point. Wait, 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 wait. And then when the ball goes through there, they have to pick a stroke, what they're going to hit, what they're going to do. They can, you can send in cricket, you can send it 360 degrees around. Or not, right behind you, because that's a wicket. OK, but what about multitasking? So that's one thing to do playing cricket, but what if you have of, of more things to do? And now we come to the work, some of the work done in our lab. And, and this is, we, we, a lot of the work is done in virtual environments. So you're wearing a head-mounted display, you have binocular display, it's very nice. And the, the, um, the recent displays uh, go up to 100 degrees field of view. So you really feel immersed um, you know, in there in a way that you would in, in a, uh, say, in a computer game where you're just staring at a, a very small field of view. But here in this, um, this work, um, you're walking down a sidewalk and you pick up these purple things by bumping into them and then you don't bump into the blue things and then you have to stay on the walkway. So here's one venue with buildings and here's a more, um, um, a different venue with all these objects here. And this is uh, this upside um, cow is in honor of, I think it's Wolfgang Platz. He's a German performance artist that exploded a cow um, from a helicopter famously in, in 2001. But here it is. But how, how could distracting could that be? It's very distracting. And so um, if you're a saliency aficionado, you must be looking at that. 
So here we go, we have multitasking, and the people are standing there and looking, and they're being told, given instructions um, on what to do. And here's where they're looking. And so here, in the case of building, um, here's this, here's the case of the performance art, there's this. And you can see that, um, and here's all your task objects, to pick up the litter and avoid the objects and stay on the footpath and, and here's some grass. But you can see, wow, you know, saliency and it, you know, the, the, a lot of this other stuff is getting gaze points. But then you ask, you tell them to go and immediately the distractors are gone. So this is why they're kind of, um, maybe they have ADD, they're not paying attention to the instructions. And then um, all of a sudden they go, and all the gaze points are on, on what to do. So this is so exciting, before, after. So, um, so that's one thing, and this is, this is, by the way, work with Konstantin Rothkopf. He's at FIAS in, 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 uh, in Frankfurt. Um, and um, now, and, but um, what, when he's getting his PhD, he did this work, and, and here's another very, very beautiful thing he did was he, for all these, each one of these dots is of, of eye fixation of, of, of a subject, and he just uh, recorded lots of subjects' data, and when you are in this task we just talked about, when you're picking stuff up, you look um, right in the middle, so you're going towards it, but this, these objects, when you're going around it, you look at the edges. So you're kind of going around it. And, and so what, here, hey, saliency people, these objects are the same, right? They're just these big rectangularoids. And, but what you do with them um, is your, you use gaze completely different because you're doing two different kinds of tasks. One, you're sort of like skiing, you're going around a gate, you're, and, and the other one is you're, you're actually picking it up. Okay, so here is like La Piste de Resistance. This is work done by my colleague, um, Mary Hayhoe, and her lab, and J her student, Jason Droll, Droll, did this for his PhD. And what, what's happening here, is, has anybody seen this work already? I'm checking in with you, okay. Um, this, is, this is gonna be slow-mo. Um, slow motion view, and it's in your virtual and, and reality. And this is a rather special thing here is the um, fourth, these things are the, your, the thumb, tip of your thumb and the tip of your forefinger. So you're using pinch grips. And um, what, we, what we have is, is one of these, uh, is a sensible phantom. Um, it has these pl um, plan planometer, um, arms coming out for each one of the um, finger gimbals, and um, they're motor driven. So if, you re if the computer knows where you are in space, so if you reach into space where an object is, the motors push back. And so it feels just like the resistance force you would get if you actually was a real object. We had a faculty candidate who did this, who did the desk, and then she took off the helmet, she says, where are the blocks? And, and, and um, she didn't get the job. But, um, but it's a very, very realistic sen sensation. And so let's, let's see it. And it's kind of like a task, you, you're supposed to put these, um, you're supposed to put, you, it's, a psych it's psychology, okay? Cognitive psychology. You get this cue, the blue block, block, pick up the blue block and put the blue block on the conveyor belt on your left. And it goes away. That's so exciting, we have to see it again. Okay, so now you know what's coming. Um, the little arrows are pointing to blue, the fingers go over, and of course the crosshairs are the gaze, right? And then slow-mo, one of these saccades right to the cue, voom, it goes away, right? And you're told, as a subject, um, $10 an hour, in US that's like a, a euro, um, the, the, you're told that if anything changes, you should throw it away in the little dustbin. This is virtual reality, but this is a dustbin. If you put it in there, whoop, it goes, right? So any changes at all, color, texture, put it in there. Now, of course, everybody in the room, even the people at the back, trading stocks on E-Trade e -trade or something, even they saw that it changed color, right? Okay. You didn't see it, Paul? I didn't see it. Huh? Oh my God. I missed it completely there, no? I'm sorry. I was looking at you all the time. Don't get old, is all I can say. 
like the rest of us. The <laughs> bad things away too. Okay, here we go. Blue, 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 blue. My God. Okay, well, all right then. But in 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 in, in, in reality, as, as, as Heo has shown that, and, and Jason Droll, that you, you of, of course, what you do, psychology, you do lots of things where nothing changes, and then you throw these in, 5% catch trials. And, and typically what happens is people do not notice the change at all, right? Even though on lots of the traces, the crosshairs are right on the thing. So, hey, wake up psychology. Now, there's red on your retina, and it's coming in, it's salient, but nothing happens, right? You don't notice it, and, the, and the, the working hypothesis that's been tested in lots of different ways is that when you code it as blue, when you initially code it, code it as blue, it's coded internally as blue, and then you don't have to check it because of course it's not gonna change because things don't change their color. And so what happens is, um, you know, you, it's just blue. You don't have to look at it again. And the important lesson, really important lesson, really important lesson for understanding vision, is it because that the only things you see are the things you actively code in the brain. So basically, whatever model you're running, that's what you see. And if you don't have it in the model, you don't see it. The most dramatic demonstration of this is the phantom limb people that think when they are missing a limb, they think, think they still have it, and the working hypothesis there is the motor system still working. Um, it's, it's just uh, that, that, they, that, that um, it doesn't have the proper input. So deep inside the brain is very dark, the neurons um, don't, can't see out, and so they just take a vote. So vision says nothing's there, but motor says it's all there. And so motor wins, so that people will say they have a limb when it, they don't. It's been amputated for some accident, from some accident or injury. And so the same thing, but everyday vision is just like this. In, in, in the individual saccades, you, you code little p quanta of information, and that's seeing. So the, the things that you can talk about are the things you see. So people get terribly excited about change blindness where they do these things where you check in into a hotel, say, and, and you're, you're filling out your form, and the clerk ducks under for a moment to get something, and then another person comes up, another psychological thing. So you're looking at a different person, um, uh, and, and, but you, people don't notice the change. So they don't notice the change because um, nothing about wrong with ho hotel clerks, but you, you just want a person, right, who's gonna give you some, some blobby moving thing, hands you your room key, you're done. You know, and so you don't, you're not going to have a beer with this person, so right, so you don't care. And, and so vision, that's vision, it's like that, but you think you saw the guy, but if somebody asks you upstairs what he looked like, mm, you don't know. So in this one, as far as I understood it, the gaze was directly on the box as it, as it changed color. Uh -huh. um, and if the, the point is that you no longer need that information, therefore you don't attend to it, why was the gaze, why is the gaze then directly um, on oh, because you have to get it on a conveyor belt. So you're you're attending to it, but only um, you're only actively assimilating the information you need. Yes, you have, you know you have this. It well, okay. This is a PhD thesis for you because um, exactly what's happening. I don't think we know, but you know you have to read the cue. Um, let's see. Okay, this is we'll form the hypothesis right now. So what's happening? Let what, see if we can come up with something. So I think you have to read the cue. So there's the cue. He's like right. So the gaze goes to the cue, and reading the cue, and in comes the thing, on there. So I right. I think I think um, you've practiced this. You've done this hundreds of times, and so I think you know where the belt is, and so you're just reading that cue. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. It's ru Robin, Robert. Oh, Robert? Yeah. Okay. I know the name of one person. I'm very terrible at names. That's probably my limit. Okay, um, just kidding. The, so here's our, our abstract idea is that if for this multitasking, 
you can you can have only a, a limited set of these m tests alive because they're stealing neural cycles and and um, if you if you have too many um, who knows what will go wrong there'll be crosstalks you just can't have it and so this we work a lot on this problem up here now magically the, so the story goes the hypothesis goes that even though you have millions and millions of things you can do there you need some sort of cognitive operating system that lights them up and puts them to sleep as you need them and you can do this very quickly like 300 milliseconds or less and, and so how this happens and, and how the indexing gets done, we don't know. But you've got to believe in something. So, so that's what we believe. Somehow it happens. And so what, one thing we've done is in walking, um, again, we ta introduced this topic earlier. So now what we'll do is take a look inside the engine of, of these modules. So if you have these task modules, how are they expressed? You need some sort of mathematical representation of them. And so um, one thing we've tried is reinforcement learning. So basically, um, uh, if you have a module, how, you, how do you get it to do the thing? You just burn in some protocol by having it do it over and over and over and over again, and then in comes the protocol. So um, in some fast forward motion um, development, the whole human development is, is patched into some, um, uh, you know, a, a few hundreds of, of coding. And what, what you do is you get something like this. It's really, if, you, if we go forward, it's kind of important that you understand this. So the, you really have to ask a question if, if, this is if I do a bad job and it's unclear, okay? Because everything kind of depends on this. But what happens is that for the, say this is picking up litter. So what happens is vision, just like getting the color, it uses color to get you the nearest litter object. And then what you get is a heading to it. So you get an angle and a distance. I can't resist doing this to Paul. Um, okay, and then what happens to that is you've learned this. So what if you learn these two things? And they're actually in the same coordinate system. This is just tipped up. Um, but what you learn as a policy is what you should do. And reinforcement learning um, in, in, the, in the most inelegant form, which we have here, uses this table. So there's lots of fancy ways you can code this table using um, continuous functions. But we're, in here, it's shown in its most pedestrian form, which is every discrete little cell here has the policy, is what you should do. And so here, this litter ends up here. You can see this is log compressed. This is like a big table, angle and distance. And so here, this is your policy, which is um, very boring. We were talking about the most boring city in Germany, that's Osnabrück. But here's one of the most boring tables you can have in reinforcement learning, and that's for this go get the litter. But here's the exciting part, is that um, reinforcement learning tells you the value of doing that. Okay? Do you think you, so don't, you don't agree with me with the Osnabrück? No, what? Osnabrück. Huh? There are some people from Osnabrück. Yes. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have experts. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> but then, so we have to interpret this table as so you have the image, you filter the image, and now you get one one dot somewhere that says here we have something interesting. Yeah. And your table here now tells you which heading direction to take, <coughs> given that you are at zero there at the bottom. Yeah, that's where you are. You're here. It gives you then your heading direction of, of where to pick it up. Yeah. And this is really what's happening. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and but the big thing is reinforcement learning. So, oh, you know, I think every, well, this is a test to see if people know this, but um, basically, you know, how do you program yourself? The, you know, the, the prevailing um, idea is that you have secondary reward, right? So when you do something good, um, your brain gives you a little re juice reward for that. It's dopamine, right? So dopamine is a secondary reward um, that rewards you for something. You know, oh, I got my paper in the mail, you know. I email my paper, a little shot. And, um, <laughs> right, you, everybody believes this, right? <laughs> Gotta find some agreement. Catalonia, Catalonia freedom! <laughs> no? Okay. okay but, but it's true, it's, this is, the, whether, you, this is, whether this is news or not, this is a prevailing view, is that when you program yourself, the brain has to have an internal model of what's happening, and then uses dopamine, this juice reward thing, a little chemical reward to, to, to get to rate the value of the different things you try. 
And of course, um, you can easily see if you're the one giving this out, things can go wrong. You know, I was in graduate school and, and uh, what was it, the 70s and all these dopers from the 60s were there as professors and I was in math course and, 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 and we asked him, what are we, where, when, when are we going to get our grades? He says, oh, just give yourself the grade you think you deserve. Uh, and and, and um, so, what, you know, what are you going to do? A, of course, you know, I'm an A person. And, and, and so, so, but the, the secondary reward system works that way, right? So you can, which you can find out, and if you want to um, bring your life to a quick end, you can start using cocaine. And basically what that does is it just breaks into the door, uh, dopamine storehouse and just gives you tons of dopamine. And then your, your life is finished, but at least you've learned a scientific principle. Um, so, and it can, is it right? And it, I had an undergraduate I really liked. He, he said, he said, no, I, in the course he said, no, I understand the brain. It's the secondary reward system gone mad, right? And, and when you think that um, John Travolta is a Scientologist and he believes his body is inhabited by space aliens, you kind of think, yeah, there might be something, there might be something too. John, John Travolta is an American actor. <laughs> But permanently, he believes that he's in habit, and so does Tom Cruise, for that matter. They have space aliens in their body. I think there's a YouTube thing on it. Okay, but there, let's get back to the present. The, the important thing is we can the this secondary reward thing. We have the value of doing things. That's really important, and because um, because when we have the modules, they're all going to get their little table. So here they are. We won't go through all the sidewalk. It's good to stay in the middle, and then obstacles. Ouch! Um, if you're walking fast and something's right in front of you, stub the toe. Right. So it's really bad to be walking fast with an obstacle right in front of you. A little dip here, and here's the little policies. And you can see that um, two of them want to go to the left, and one of them wants to go to the right. Not like the U.S., where everybody wants to go to the right. Um, and so what should we do? Who should we listen to? Ah, but we have the value. Each one has a value. So again, it's like American politics. The more money, the more votes. And so um, we're going to let the secondary reward system take the modules and we'll weight the policies by the value of doing it. And that's what we'll do. So walking down the sidewalk, where should we go? Um, the, modules, the modules get put in their votes with their value attached, and then we just take the average. So that's the, the in this situation, the motor action is, is pretty much defined. But what about eye movements? What do they do, and where should they look as you're going down the sidewalk? Where? And so, um, Nathan Sprague, a former student, he came up with this. Um, that's a formula. Let's look, at the, let's look at this first. So what he said is that, um, he just walked into my office and said, I got it. He says, when you are not looking at something, um, your belief about it's where you are in its state space becomes uncertain. But then, when you look at it, um, you know where you are. So before, after, before, after, before, after. And so what we could do is, what this formula is saying is that take each module and compute the difference between evaluating it, its little Q value, which was the Q value is the jargon for that little graph we were looking at secondary reward, it, we, we, what's, if we update it, what's the difference between, and we update it, we, we, we hypothesize updating everybody, uh, somebody's going to win. And so we can go on, um, and, and let's go right to this. Here's, here's, the, here's our avatar doing the subject's job of walking down. So we, since we're in virtual reality, we don't need people, we can get our own people. And so these are avatars that, that have been programmed and they go down here. And here they're using Nathan's formula. And so and I haven't, this tables don't have the little arrows, but the beige is the before uncertainty and the little color is the after. 
And so this is the, this is the obstacle avoidance. And, and since it's very close, it's very important. So it gets a look and then it's even closer and even closer. So three looks in a row, but then you clear it. And now the sidewalk uncertainty, which has been growing, gets a look. And now this can at the end um, garners three looks. And this, is, this is just XY in that little trajectory. Like this here? Months, yeah. No. Sort of no, 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 no. That's a good question, Paul, because it's it, it's 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 wrong in an extremely helpful way. It's one of these. It's one of these tables. It's one of these tables. Okay. So, so I'm just I'm just replicating these tables for you without the arrows. Okay. So these are the actions. These are, and this now this is going to be help. This is a really helpful question because there's seven instances of torn, and so in the computer simulations, they 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 they. Are, are kind of codified in a, in a rather lockstep manner. So every 300 milliseconds we decide, we have this voting thing to see who looks. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Paul. That was good. The other good. thing is that then you need some sort of position invariant recognition of these objects. Uh -huh. You need the position invariant recognition of now these, these obstacles, like Be the, the blue cube and the purple circle. I, yeah. So you're because? Your avatar is walking around, it's moving in space. No, that's another clever question. That's another clever question, and again you're wrong, and it's in an interesting way. So, like, uh, I don't know, it, it, was it um, Die Hard Second 2 where um, the guy had to walk through Harlem with the board on him? So you have this board attached to you, right? And so it's, right, it is egocentric, so it does move with you. And so, of course, unfortunately, the objects move, move around, and this can hurt you because um, the, you can, you can call this a bug or a feature, depending on, uh, on how you feel about it. But lots of times when you avoid an ob obstacle, you turn this way and you don't see it anymore. So turning back looks good because maybe there's litter over there and went, right? So fortunately, you're walking very fast. So this, it's just a moment of despair and it passes. <laughs> okay. So here's Nathan. He tried this thing out and, and um, he, he got that he beat um, the round robin, so you could look at the, you could just cycle through, or you could just pick one of these objects at random and look at it. And the value of doing it um, is is better. I, I don't know if it's a work in Europe, but in the American West, there's camping and bears. There's parks with bears in and grizzly bears, and, and um, depending on which bear it is, you should run like hell or, or play, pretend to play dead, be dead. But anyway, in the running bear, there's, I think, a grizzly you would run. And so these guys, two guys are camping, and they look down the trail, and there's a huge grizzly is coming, and um, they don't know what to do. They're in a panic. One guy starts putting on his tennis shoes, and the guy says, why are you doing that? He says, you can't outrun a bear. He says, I just have to outrun you. And, and, and so, um, so the, the thing is that even though this is a very small, you can, see, you can see that it's a very small advantage here, but 150,000 eye movements per day, it starts adding up. And then, of course, you, you know that um, star athletes, they typically make um, faster eye movements to the place where they have to make, yeah. How good is human there? Oh, how good is the humans in terms of? In terms of reward, so if you add a bar for human, how good is human? Oh, um, we don't, I mean, we don't know. So this is a good, but this is a good question because we're going to try to get at that. Okay, we're going to try to model. Now what we haven't done is we need to make this model a little better in modeling the human data, right? So it's not, it's not quite ready for prime time in terms of directly comparing it with human data. But in the next instant, I'm going to show you a little step that makes it more compatible. So hang on and, and ask your, you know, if you're not satisfied, you get your money back, don't, don't you, Paul? You, like a check comes. No it's, okay. Mm, um, are we running behind time and should we do this? I'm going to skip over it. We can come back. Um, but I'll just tell you what the answer is. Um, if you, the, the nice thing about the reinforcement learning is that, um, so what is reinforcement learning? The value of doing things, everything has a value. Picking up a litter in New York State, it's like five cents a bottle um, for, for returning bottles, five cents. 
Um, and so, but in, in your life, everything has some kind of value of, of doing it, and evolution's trying to get you to pick the right things. And, 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 and um, okay, so that reinforcement learning says, if you know the value of things, I, I, reinforcement learning, can tell you what your policy should be, policy should be, what actions to take. But a very interesting thing you can do is that if you have some data, actions that you took, can you back into knowing what the rewards would be? So that would be a very interesting scientific tool because now you could just take subject data and determine what, what particular values they're imposing on, on, on the decisions they have to make. And so, um, of course, anytime you want to turn things around, you can use Bayes' rule. So um, um, if you have some observations and you want the reward, um, that's a hard problem. But you can use Bayes' rule to turn around and say, well, um, if you have the probability of the observations given the reward, um, you can use this formula. And basically, with it, I'm going to skip over the math that tells you exactly how to do that and, and jump to the, the chase. But um, the bottom line is that modules make it easier. So the actual, the actual computations involved in that formula are vastly simulated with modules. And so, ooh, where's the pointer? Um, so what are we doing? This is again Constantine Rothkopf's work. And for each module, you would have some data in phase space, in a particular modular space for the, sub for the different tasks. So here's the walkway, and the state space is angle and heading, angle and heading, so that these two um, data traces are su superimposed in each case. Here's some data. And, um, so what Constantine did for his PhD is he, he basically showed you how to compute using that formula. And so um, here on the yellow is the avatar walked the path. And of course this is a helicopter view of the, of the, the path when, and the purple things are obstacles and the, and the, sorry, the purple things are litter and the blue things are obstacles. And so here, the yellow is actually what the avatar did, and the orange is the path that the avatar took when he inverted the data to get the rewards. Try to say that very carefully. You have data, using the inverse method, you can get the value of the different modules. When you have the values, you can do the conventional reinforcement learning thing again and run down and generate a trajectory. So here, you start with the yellow, get the rewards, do the orange. And this is just a demonstration. If you don't dial in the right rewards, then you start wandering all over the place. So it really helps to have the right rewards. This is rather amazing because this data is human data. So it shows that um, humans pretty much um, um, do the same thing. So here they're told to do the, the litter, and here they're told to ju um, just avoid the obstacles, and here they're told about both. But let's concentrate on these two. And you can see that, okay, there are some individual differences, but by and large, there's a huge amount of similarity. And so, you know, we get, you get very excited about this because you think, oh, they're doing the same thing. And, um, um, so you can try, take this data and estimate what the reward values are. And here's pick up the litter only and pick up the obstacle only. And you can see that the actual reward values here are actually reflecting the task. I don't understand. They are blue but red in this case. Okay. Um, are the colors the wrong way around? Um, um, yes. This is a stroop effect to keep you awake, Paul. That's fine. That's what I'm asking. This is litter. Okay. So you, it's good to pick up litter. Mm -hmm. This is obstacles. Bad to bump into an obstacle. So when you're told, to pick hay subjects only pick up the litter. This trace, and it's a little hard. People don't want to walk through an obstacle, even if it's virtual, mm -hmm. right? So there's a little. They just can't stop themselves. 
right? And here is obstacle. So litter, I don't know, you might be, maybe you accidentally picked up litter you weren't supposed to, I don't know what happens. But here is only pick up obstacles and then the, the math is showing that this is the reward for that data for obstacles, a big negative reward. Whereas here, only pick up litter, you, you get this, this is the estimated value of litter. But would you have expected anything else given the task instruction to the subject? No, but the, I, the, the, this, the nice thing about this is the math mm -hmm. agrees with you. Well, but there are some exceptions, right? So for in the, in the litter case, I don't know what the methods right now, but, but you are, the subjects are sort of dealing also with these objects, even though it's a litter task. And the I, know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Research, it's just like being a parent, right? Everybody else says, an ugly child, right? But the person who wrote the paper, beautiful. Okay. So let's do driving. Let's move on to driving. So here's our driving simulator. And, and, um, and basically is this hydraulic platform to give you a sense of acceleration if you want to and then you're wearing the head mounted display in here and off you go. Let's see a human driving and now the task is going to be a two task thing. You're supposed to follow a red car and you're supposed to obey the speed limit. I think it's 30 miles an hour. So, and the, the red car is going a little faster than 30 so you're a little frustrated because um, to be, keep speed you have to let the car go and the go, and then it, to to keep falling the car, you have to exceed the speed limit. So the tests are, are are competing against each other, and let's so let's see some data. So you're inside the helmet, and you're driving along, and of course the crosshairs um, are are the eyes, and 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 um, okay, here we go. Waiting for the red car, waiting for the red car. This is, by, by the way, the Iowa City, the National Driving Center. So that's probably the most boring city in the U.S. if you're interested. Yeah, was there for a <laughs> <laughs> so isn't that beautiful? If you get a track like this, wow, that's amazing. Follow the car and then speedometer and follow the car and follow the car, speedometer, follow the car, follow the car, follow the car, speedometer. Ooh, beautiful, isn't it just... <gasps> Right? It's like looking at a Renoir or something. And very nice. And you did see the other for the truck, right? Okay. But the question is, how are we to explain the data? Right? And so we have to go a little deeper for your gentleman's question, the gentleman who is called? Uh, Benedict. Yell it out. Benedict. Benedict? Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. But you're, you shortened it for me, Benny? Benedict. Oh, Bennard. Beanard. Oh, but I see Benedict is the Anglis Anglization of the German or something. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll don't discuss care. it later. All right. Benedict, I actually like if you can live with that. <laughs> okay. Um, so here, um, right, if, if you're in grad school, you can identify with this because this is Brian Sullivan's work, and uh, despite the fact that um, everybody's yelling, at him to do this, he plotted this on two different scales. So here's three seconds here and here's 20 seconds here. So advisors tear their hair out. That's why this is very thin up here. I wasn't an advisor, but, but you can see that, what, what are we looking at? We're looking at the interlook intervals and you can see what you just saw in the data is that the, 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 um, the, the, the following car is so intensive that when, you're, when, you're, when your gaze goes, you immediately go back. The gaze goes, you immediately go back. But the speedometer, um, it's not so important, so the time between looks, it has this big tail. And so, um, as I think my interpretation of Benedict's question is we, we have to be a little more quantitative in figuring this thing out. And so this is a helicopter view of the driving and you have your speed and you're following in the red car and you're the blue car. And what happens, this is important, what happens is when you're not paying attention to a particular task, it drifts and it gets uncertain, just like before. And, but when you choose to update it, you um, know where it is and maybe the other one's still drifting and on you go. So um, in the model, we can um, weigh, try different 
importances for the task and also different noise levels. And this is something Nathan didn't do. So now we're varying the noise levels and we're, in, we're varying the importance ratio. And so here, this says speed, so this is actually the wrong way around. This is because it's another graduate student doing this. But this says speed's so important that speed is getting the, 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 the short looks and the following the, the following the car is getting the long looks. And you can see what's happening is the following is kind of going here, and the, but you're really good at doing this speed. But if you add noise to the system, then um, you're, you're worse to the speed, if you add noise to the, to the speed system. And so even what worse. What does noise mean in this case, Dana? Is the car like jittering around on the road, or the, the speedometer? The model is jittering around in your head. The car is driving, but you don't see the car. You're driving on your model. That's an important. You're helping me this morning, boy. You're right on my wing. Um, you, this is a very, very important. I should have said this is what's happening, of course, it, for also for the previous walking. Right, the model is in your head. What's happening out there? You don't know unless you look. And so, in inside, the two models are running. And if your set point is drifting in the car, you're just following the set point. So you could follow the imaginary car right off the road. But when you look, of course, you know where it is again. And so the important thing is to look. And so here, um, you're spending an, an inordinate amount of time on the speedometer. So these are the, just the wrong parameters. And you have to go ahead to these parameters, which are more like the right parameters. And so this plot, where you're emphasizing the, the following task more, this plot looks more like the data we saw the human data, and then this is, you can show you're better now, but then your speed is, is drifted off. You have this error. And so you can put all these things together in this strange phase plot that plots the, the velocity of once against the position of the other task, but it's gonna tells you something because as you raise this speed threshold, and raising the speed threshold is making speed less important, um, the speed error starts drifting, but the, the distance error gets better and better. So here's the, t the, the two tasks trading off each for each other for parameters. And so um, this isn't quite, it's, so Benedict is not going to be satisfied, but this is the best we can do for him because what happens is you, you, you the, the thing is, it's the thing you want to go after is uncertainty and reward, the product thereof. And so, that, so what's happening is you're going to, um, when the point is that these two things are together, and so you have to know the noise in your system and the relative reward values to know what to do. And so here, when you, when you lower this threshold, um, you're making speed more important. So as you lower the threshold, um, um, speed is becoming more important for a reason I didn't say, but I will say briefly, is how you're doing this is you have a barrier model. And so when um, something drifts to the barrier, you get a look. And, and so that if you lower the barrier, you hit it earlier. And so as we lower the value, then your speed, your, your speed lets, you get more speed looks. But you also, the, the noise is important too. So you have to know both those to be somewhere on these curves and figure out um, where you are. But, it, but the triumph, or these, the, the high watermark so far, is that we can make these plots from the data. And so we now, now we can do the thing where we try to f we let the car do it, right? This is like, okay, bottom line. If you have these parameters, you think they're working, put them in the car, let the robot, let the avatar drive the car and see what happens. So here is the car now being driven by the avatar. And um, you can see for this particular choice of parameters, it's not quite a good match because you probably everybody in the room has a good uh, memory and they remembered that the human data didn't have so many speedometer looks, right? So this has, this has more speedometer looks than the actual um, subject data we were looking, but that means we have to adjust the parameters. But still, um, it's awfully beautiful, don't you think? What? Don't you agree? It's true. It's true? Your name is? Anna. Anna, that's easy. That sounds Spanish to me. Is it Spanish? No, Italian. Italian, okay. Two N's. 
Oh, okay, sorry. It's Europe, like I could start a war. But. Okay, so Anna, I'll get it. Um, all right, I'm gonna work on whatever Benedict is in the work in the break. So this is like, if we, if we are having a break, this would be a time for the break, because we're sort of co covered one quanta of material. And uh, you know, of course, um, what's nice about being in academics, the professors get to travel, but the people, actually people who do the work, um, they get to travel too. Work themselves to death. Yeah, um, <laughs> right, to death. Yeah, this is like, you know, Texas actually is renowned for having a long time in the PhD program. <laughs> it's very hard. It's very hard to get a parking space, even for a faculty member. It's hard to get a good space, and so I, I took a picture of myself one year on, next to the lot I wanted, the next to the sign, begging. You know, and I sent it into the parking people, nothing. And then so the, the next year I put this, those clothes on this skeleton and took it out there. And um, I still didn't get a sticker, but they did tell me something about the, their rules for when I would get one. Uh, anyway, so the, but Dimitri Kitt and he did in the car driving, this is about the car, Dimitri Kitt did all the, the, the translated the model into all the videos and the eye movements you saw and then Leif, he did the actual um, the barrier models and all the, the calculations of when, when, when the particular eye movements are, are going to be uh, scheduled. And, and these are the rest of the people in, in the lab. Um, so, what, so that's halfway through. Halfway it, through this is Europe. Do we have coffee now, or, or do we, get, we just keep going? Well, usually we just have a two hour lecture or something like this. Wow. Because this is Europe. And see, in the US, Students can't concentrate for more than 50 minutes. They're, they're just like spent. No, but here they stop concentrating from the beginning. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. <laughs> I see. Okay. okay, are you ready for part two? Yeah. Part two? Uh, I okay. A question. A question. Yeah. So you're using sort of the modules uh, coming from reinforcement learning uh, where the underlying model assumes that the state of the system is observable. Okay, so those are the conversions we saw for, for Q-learning, where the state of the system is observable. Yes. For dealing with a problem that is essentially a PUMDP, right? So in a way, uh, the method that we have could be understood as an heuristic method for doing certain type of PUMDPs using these modules from Q-learning. I love you. <laughs> this is perfectly, so perfectly stated. You know, because you look in the books, oh, PUMDP, PUMDP, it has to be a PUMDP. Of course, life is a PUMDP, everything's a PUMDP, right? And so, of course. And so the one, one tactic, one, one approach is solve the PUMDP, right? And then you go in the literature and see the methods for solving it, and boy, you know, <laughs> huh. You know, if your brain had to solve a PUMDP, you'd be dead, in my view. <laughs> Right. You have a heuristic method. Something, and of course, you can get in trouble, right? We talked about you can bump into obstacles and stuff, but most of the time you're okay. You know, occasionally you win a Darwin Award, you went over or something, you know, <laughs> some limit. But most of the time you can recover. So even if you get a nasty part of the state space, it's you're a dynamical system, and then you can sort of glide through it. It's like hitting a pothole or something. You know, this is my view, and it, it's, it, it would be not popular in a lot of circles because everything is actually a PUMDP, as you say, but it is a heuristic way for dividing it up. And, and I wouldn't say it's a great to talk to young people because there's a future, right? It's, it's, it's obviously, there are lots and lots, I suspect, lots and lots of different ways of dividing it up. Right, and this is just one way to just say, well, think about ways of dividing it up, and then you might you might get lucky and turn figure out something really really cool. But um, so that's the story. Okay, it's a great question. Yeah, Kevin. I didn't I didn't fully understand really how your thing worked, but it seemed to me that um, it looked like it was sta the parameters were stationary throughout the whole sequence that you were looking at. So yeah. Now, it, see, intuitively, when I drive, where I have a task to do, it would seem that I would drive along trying to uh, uh, accomplish that task. And if I see that it's not, I'm not doing very well, I might modify the parameters I use, the importance I'm giving to this or that aspect of the task. So it would be sort of more recursive, I'd say, in the adjustment of the parameters during the actual driving sequence. And I think you, I, you know, I, I understood. 
Did everybody understand Kevin's question? Yeah, I, that, I think that's a perfectly reasonable question. I think that um, if you look at people's driving habits, that the evidence is against you on that hypothesis. If we test your hypothesis, you basic, when driving a car, you kind of learn the little protocols, and they're kind of burned in. And what you would do, though, I would argue, is the multitasking is incredibly important. And so if you have lots of tests to do, you, you really need that operating system in there to you know, add tests and drop tests as required. You know, in, in Texas, these poor young kids, I guess, and they're texting while driving and they just kill themselves, right? Because they're typing something, bam, they're dead. You know, so you, you, you text, um, texting is a very demanding test, extra test to try and do, even though people do, lots of people text successfully, you know? What I say would work for learning to fly. But I'm saying, yeah, so learning, to, so the, the book on that is like 100, once you get 15,000 miles, you've gotten kind of burned in the basic ideas. And then, you, you know, as you get older, you get smarter and smarter and your table gets reformed. I think that maybe that's what you're alluding to. I think it's a, the, the parameter adjustment occurs on a longer scale. So as, as you get a lot of miles, like thousands of miles under your belt, you are adjusting your parameters because you're learning in certain situations what are the key features to take, pay, pay. But whether it's very plastic in terms of, you were implying that, you know, from like Vancouver, right? If I'm driving around Vancouver, the start of the trip to the end of the trip, I don't think, I'm, I think I'm not a psychologist, but I don't think the evidence would support that you modify the parameters under those circumstances. No, what I was really saying is it'd be interesting to build the learning process into your model so that it could be continually learning essentially. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That would be true. That would be true. But we're already cheating now because, you know, you know, with the humans, most of, a lot of this stuff gets learned, burned in through development. You know, it's a very lengthy process where all the parameters of your whole body are ch and intellectual capacity is changing. And so we've finessed that down to this stubby little module thing here. It's, it's already an embarrassment, but... But I mean, sorry to monopolize this. But it seems that it's really interesting. It's just like the previous example you gave, where you essentially have two or three constraints uh, in your dynamic action and sequences uh -huh. that you're trying to balance and yeah. you're trying to find the importance of each of the rewards. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so that's a kind of general problem of learning that would work for any task. Really, it's not. It would. It would. And, and it's yeah. Not even just a not just a motor task, but you know other even cognitive tasks. Okay. Well, I so shouldn't. You had a learning aspect to it, then you could generalize completely what you've done here to a more general... I think so. I think so. I, so I would, right, in, in the European spirit of cooperating with everybody all the time, I would agree with you, and then, but I think and the only thing I would be a stick in the mud about in driving, I think you do really burn in these protocols that are hard to change. But then it's something else about the model. Like for the car driving example, your, the benchmark would be something like accuracy and then the, the eye movement dynamics. Right? So how well does your model actually match the human performance there? And what are the key controlling parameters? Mm -hmm. Well, it didn't really show as much of that. I didn't, and it's partly because this, is, this last work on the car is just out of the oven. You know, so the, some, some of these things got emailed me en route. But that's where we have to go mm -hmm. if this works and be taken seriously, is we have to actually do that step of getting the data and showing what particular parameters. But I did, what I did to try to satisfy you is showed you that when we vary the parameters, that it, there's, there's a, a for our particular data, there was kind of a sweet spot. Um, a, it's this one. It's all these, all these interval histograms look different. And this is the one, this is the interval histogram that predicts, that matches our eye, in this limited data set, this interval histogram matches the eye movement data the closest. And so that would imply that the, this, this, um, this, this particular dichotomy of uh, segregation of the behavior should be the one you would see. Right. Yeah, okay, good. Okay. But thanks. All right, so, yeah? Well, uh, I have another comment, so. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, no. Okay. no. Comment it. Okay, great. So, no, uh, I think that one of the reasons why humans look very often at the speedometer, uh, well, could not 
be only due to the choice of parameters, is that you get feedback from also from other senses. In the sense, so like in your model, you, you have a drift in the, in the total model uncertainty, and you use eye movements to reduce it. Whereas for the in the case of the speedometer or the speed of the car, humans also use other senses such as uh, proprioceptive feedback. They do. The motor system. So the, the, the drift. The drift rate is not the same as the drift rate as the, as the uh, let's say, the estimation of the, the red car position. That's a lovely comment. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's basically you're saying it's more complicated than portrayed here. And I, 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 would, I, would, I would agree with that. You know, if I, yeah, if I just wanted to argue with it a little bit, I would say some of these things like speed, it can be, you can sort of adapt out, like uh, it's unreliable. So if you're driving on the highway for a long time, you kind of lose track of exactly how fast you're going and the speedometer becomes more important. You know, and, and, and of course, airplane flying, um, that happens a lot because your vestibular system accommodates to the attitude of the plane. And, and so you, the, where you think you are and where the plane think it actually is, it becomes very, very different. I think John Kennedy, the young John Kennedy, he, he he crashed, and, and that was a, people believe that's a source of his his crash. Is the flying a plane? You start turning, and the vestibular system thinks you're going straight, and and so the turn gets tighter and tighter, and you just go in, into the, the ground. And I never got my pilot's license, but I had, did have lessons. And one thing we did is uh, we were trained. We had this hood on, and the the instructor would put the plane in some crazy attitude and then you'd have to, you weren't allowed to look outside, you just had to look at the instrument plan and figure out what was wrong and then try to correct it, you know. But you, I take your point, really. Okay, moving on. Okay. So this has to be a whole new th panel here. We let's put this to bed and wake this up. Part two, the sequel. Okay, so well, hmm. Um, so what do you do when, so moving to Texas, hmm, we got a lot of money for moving. You know, if I'd have known we'd get this much money just for moving, I would have moved a lot sooner. But, so what to do? What does an old researcher do? So, um, my personal choice was I decided I could keep doing what I was doing, but with all this resources, I should try to do something different. And motor control um, of the whole body, not just eye movements. And so, um, what should you do if you want to do something new? My personal um, thing is I always feel like they're doing something wrong, I have to fix it. So it's a little bit contentious, but that's, the, that's, the, that's basically the motivation for this little part two, is there's something about motor control, in particular human motor control, that is very different than, say, robot motor control. I was trying to get, um, I was trying to get Danica yesterday to say something about this, but she, she was very skillful, and every time I made a thrust, she dodged it. But it's, it's the, 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 it is, this would be the, the lesson, is the robots are different than the humans in very, very, very important ways. And so we have to find out what ways, ways they are. And, and, and the answer is that the, the, um, the, 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 the movement system is gonna be start looking a little bit like the eye movement system. And so, hmm, this is just a cautionary note. When you move into a new field, of course, as an ignoramus, you think, um, it's all mine, there's nobody there. But then when you start reading the papers, it's, it's populated. You know, it's like going to South America and finding everybody. It's completely populated. Cortez, he, what, he, I don't know what he was looking for, but he found tons and tons of people and gave them small parts. But anyway, um, so here's, there's tons of people working in motor control. So what do you have to do? Um, you have to go back to nature and get a lesson from nature. So here's me getting a lesson from, from nature, the natural world. And, and what, what kinds of things would you learn? This, this is the sarcos. Now, I'm sorry you don't show, see its legs, but it's very anthropomorphic, very expensive um, anthropomorphic um, robot. And it's actuated, it has lots and lots of degrees of freedom, and it's driven by oil, 3,000 pounds per square inch for every degree of freedom. And so yeah, if you want to move, um, 
the oil around, you have to servo very quickly. So it's somewhere between 10, 10 kilohertz and 40 kilohertz to, um, for every degree of freedom to move, for move, to move, those, move those joints. And so um, we need a worthy adversary for the robot, so I'm picking the cat. And uh, of course, the cat motor control, the cortical neurons that are, 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 are directing things, they, they have very low firing rates. So 50, 50, 50 spikes per second is, is, is really moving in the cortex. So something like 50 hertz, say, say, is the neural structure in the motor cortex that's signaling the movement. So you start wondering immediately, how is it, it has to be different because you just can't servo at the rates that they, um, to keep up with the sarcos. And so, hmm, there's some, uh, one issue is compliance. So what is compliance? Is that the weight lifter, they have these big fat weight lifters and they have like 200, 300 pounds and if they make the, the barbell out of styrofoam, pow, they practically injure themselves and pushing it through the roof. It's because they set their muscles, they can set their muscles expecting that this is going to be a very heavy thing. So basically what they do is co-contract. So your, mu your muscles come in almost pairs of flexors and extensors and if you, if you, if you freeze them up, up at the same time then you become very stiff. Like the sarcos. And for, I had this, I gave a talk to um, Birmingham recently and the, the, the guy, their recent hire was a graduate student that worked on this. And so when I said it didn't have any compliance, he said, yes, it did. And what he meant by this is that they, they can have simulated compliance. Because if they servo at a very high rate, that when you hit a table like this, the sensors can pull you back. But um, if you do the math um, and you come to, oh, shoot, that hurt. Um, when you do the math, it's very, very hard to, um, to, to have the bandwidth. To, to get that you, you're very, 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 you're done in the milliseconds to, to uh, get the whole loop going where it pulls back. And um, I shouldn't have given my karate chop, I should have just done the thing, but, um, but it's very hard to do. So you can have simulated compliance, but not real compliance. And then of course the cat, Mm, they, you can drop them from anywhere and they come out all right. And, 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 and so that has a lot. And there's no passive energy um, storage here. It's just pulling amps out of the wall at some fantastic rate. But the cat, 70% of the cat is passive. So the, the muscles themselves are spring-like. And so when the cat is bounding along, it's so like a kangaroo, is that 70% is just passive energy and only 30% it has to be supplied. So, hmm. So that's, okay, so that's one issue. The cat is, um, is different than the sarcos. And here, but there's also something else. The math is different. So we'll return to this at the end of the talk. But when you, um, the classic robotic math that came out of, I don't know, something like the 1800s, the bagistochrome pro problem. If you have a wire, you're sliding a bead down a wire. Um, what's the right shape of that wire to get the maximum velocity at the end of minimum time? And then um, this math was all was re resuscitated in, in the 60s in the US-Russian space race, how to get the rockets into the um, orbit orbital positions as fast as possible with the minimum amount of fuel. And so that's another problem. So this is, and then the, it got also um, um, co-opted by the robot guys who said, okay, um, we want the robot, that's my imagination of a robot, the blue thing, to go through this trajectory in real space. And what kinds of problems will we have to solve? Well, first of all, we have to figure out what the joint angle should do. And so the problem is, um, particularly for humans, humans have 600 muscles and, and 300 degrees of freedom, that that's an ill-posed problem. And, um, but in, in the math, um, there's a way of handling it. And, but that, that works for seven degrees of freedom, but uh, it's not very friendly to higher degrees of freedom. When you do, if you solve that problem, you still have to get the joint torques. That's another problem because then you have, an accurate, have to have an accurate model of what the robot is. If you don't quite know the inertia matrices or this friction or something, it's another technical problem. So these, these problems, this inverse way is intractable for the human system. Even though lots and lots of current research 
um, papers say it's the only way to go. So there's some dramatic tension for you. Okay, so how, if, if this isn't the way to go, which way should we go? I wonder if people have seen this, the Cornell lab. Okay, good. Well, it's like a religious sermon. You, it never hurts to see it again or hear it again. And so here we go. Amazing, I love this. I have to play it once more, I'm sorry. This is just for me, I know you've seen it, right? But, but what's a, this is, I hadn't seen this being kind of um, in a closet with respect to motor control stuff. And so what I saw is an epiphany. And the epiphany is that the movements that you can make with the skeleton are sparse in the space of all possible movements. Because vision guys already know this. Because the vision field has all the early coding of early vision is all these gabors and other things. And what, what's, the, what's the rallying cry? The rallying cry is it's sparse coding. Is the actual images that you see in the real world are very sparse compared to all possible um, images. Of course, most of, the, most of the images are TV snow and you wouldn't like that anyway. But the images have all this structure. The front end of vision is designed to pick out that structure. But the, this is, in my view, this idea is kind of a mystery or unknown to roboticists in that of thinking of maybe movements of this way too. So the movements that you can make with the skeleton are very sparse in the space of all possible movements. So, um, the, it's a big constraint. And so, um, wow, so that's a huge insight. Here's another one. My, my um, graduate student found this. He wouldn't tell me where he got this movie. This is Rahul Iyer. But this is a cat. Um, I wonder if people have seen this movie before. One person has. Right? It's a sort of a on the internet cat cruelty. What, what this is is a cat without a brain. Okay, so they've taken, the, you couldn't do this anymore, you know, because of the, of the, 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 the ways you can cr cruelly treat animals have, 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 have been um, really tightened up. But the, in this particular movie, the forebrain's been removed and so the cat basically has the brainstem and spinal cord. And, but the important lesson, the very, very important lesson is these gates for the cat are still in there. So the cat's getting a little assistance on balance. But the actual gates of running and walking are completely coded. So the movement system can do what it has to do without having the brain. So the brain just has to kind of talk to the spinal cord. And that's a, I, think, I think that's just a, a monster lesson. And also, in, in other things they've done with the cat, that if there's a little obstacle and the cat's foot's hit it, then it can go of the obstacle without any, without its, its brain. So let's take another approach. Let's not solve these hard inverse problems. Let's just go with forward problems. And so we'll have two forward problems. One is that um, we'll get the joint coordinates um, that map onto the world, particular world coordinates. And then when we do that, we'll figure out what the torques, um, once we have the joint angles, we'll figure out what torques we need to generate those joint angles. I'll spend a, a, quite a bit of time making this clear, but here's the first thing with this movie. This is Casey Green, an undergraduate who actually programmed this. So this is the face, face, space, motion capture system. Is that anybody familiar with it or, or, or have it? It's very, it's very beautiful system. Best $60,000 US I ever spent. Um, it has LED, that what's nice about it is it has cameras ringing the room that, that figure, that recognize those markers, markers and translate it into positions and has millimeter resolution. And, but what's really nice is the LEDs are all different because they have little phase codes of which one it is. So if they're temporarily occluded, occluded and reappear, the cameras instant, instantly know which one they're looking at. But here, what Casey has done is he's showing how you, it's very easy to solve this um, problem of, of figuring out the joint angles and then um, driving an avatar. So he's, he's in this avatar, has a little skeleton, and so Casey, um, what he did is he adapted that uh, the raw data from the face 
phase coded system to um, recover a skeleton with significant fide um, sufficient fidelity so he could drive that car, the avatar. I told Casey, you have to go to graduate school. And Deutsche Bank told him, um, come to London and train with us and we we'll send you anywhere in the world you want to go. So, <laughs> so graduate school, just more courses. Okay, so, so what have we done? We've got the joint angles, but now we'd like to know what the joint torques are. And, um, and so how are we going to do that? And so I'll, g I'll give you this pantomime of how we'll do it. And that is that if you had one joint and a motor on that joint, you could crank the motor and the little lever would turn. But now, supposing you had a little marker here that was moving. And supposing you had a dynamical model. So if you get ordinary differential equations, it's this, this free software on the net, and you can build stuff with it. And so what Joseph Cooper will I'll show you in a minute, he, he can build a skeletal model that is not just geometry, it has inertia matrices in it. So you could build a dynamic model and it has joints and has joint torques. And so what are we going to do with that? So imagine you have to follow this mar marker. Let me do it in easier way form. So you all know for F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration, and you, always, you all probably also know that the angular version of that is torque equals inertia times um, theta, theta double dot, the angular acceleration. And so obviously, if I told you the mass and acceleration, you could tell me the force. And if I told you the um, angular acceleration and inertia matrix, you could tell me the torque. And so you're kind of doing that here, is you're forcing this arm to follow this marker. And how are you doing that? You can wrap a little servo loop around here in the inside ODE that forces it through feedback to chase this. And then the system, the only way it can do that, it has to generate a torque here. And it turns out that that's the same torque as you would get above. So um, there's really, there's two ways to do it. Um, and um, there, you can see from this purple and blue um, overlay here, they're identical. So if w what are we going to do? Um, we'll have Joseph Cooper is going to build a model of himself. Now it's com not a complete model, so it's got fo but it's got 44 degrees of freedom. And each little degree of freedom has a motor on it, and you need to know what's the value of the torque at that motor. So what we'll do is first, we'll take the, we'll have a subject make a motion, like walking, we'll get the data, we'll recover the angles for those data, and now on Joseph's skeleton, we'll put markers where the markers are on the subject. So for every marker on the suit, there'll be a marker on the dynamic model. And we'll force those dynamic, the, one, the markers on the suit, to follow the markers on the... This is so clear, isn't it? Or is it? Votes for clarity. Okay. Well, it's enough. It's, all I want is a quorum. Okay, so here we go. Here's the movie. Is that, so first we'll do is we'll winch down, this is the, we're winching down the model so that the markers match up with the data and then off we go. We play the subject data, geometric data, and the model's forced to follow that. It's forced to generate the correct torques and then we can replay those torques. Well, Okay, there's a problem because the model isn't exactly right. But we can use what the graphics people call the hand of God. <laughs> and that is like, like a parent holding a child to get it to walk. And, and what we're doing here is we have a little extra torques 
that are trying to keep the center of gravity over the base. And what we're doing here is trying to adjust that. Aha, we got it right. So it's just a little bit of hands of God here. But without, once we've got there, we can walk off into the, the sunset if we want to. What's the error that you would have in this approach as compared to the human in the movement trajectory? You mean, is it, is it a copy? Yeah, how close do you get? Oh, as well, um, you want position data. Can I, I'll show you torque data in a minute. Yeah. No, but you, but you take it from the position data from your motion capture system, right? And from there you regenerate the trajectory. So sort of the question is, what the error now is for the different points you're tracking on the human with respect to this avatar that you're animating, right? Because this gives you a sense of the accuracy. Of we didn't do that. We should do that. So I'm going to rush home and do that. That's, <laughs> a, that's a really cool thing. That's a cool thing to do. We didn't do that. But you sh we should do that. I really like Paul. I've known him for a long time. I haven't known you for a long time, have you? Right. Through all your places you've been, except for scripts when you were there. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So um, these are. This just shows you that we can recover torques, and um, here they are. There. So we got torques, and then this is kind of a high watermark, here. Now, what's hard to believe is this isn't Joseph. This is Joseph's model. But Joseph wanted to, he wanted to, he wanted to do something he thought was dramatic, like jumping. And, and there's, he, there's also something I didn't tell you about. There's a little compliance in the joints that you can play with. And, uh, and, and on this tape, there's a stage where he um, changes the compliance and the model jumps higher than he actually did. He, he actually did. So but how does this now work? I mean, so now to make it jump, he would sort of define a trajectory. And then he jumped. Okay, he jumped. Okay, he was jumping. All right. <laughs> he did these things. Mm -hmm. But as you see, if, if you don't get it right, it just right. flops over. Yeah. So this is pretty, this is a high stress. Jumping is hard. I mean, yeah, right? You, he, I don't know. Sure. He weighs about, I don't know. 160 pounds, somewhere in that. So we weigh, he, um, we weigh about the same, but he, being a young person, is a lot taller. Than okay, this is as close as I can get to answering your question, which is, I'm not going to answer your question. I'm going to answer a question that's kind of like your question. And that is, now on this one, we got the Wii force plates. I think they go for a hundred bucks and they're, spo they're supposedly as good as these 220,000 scientific things. But they're a hundred bucks and you can, you, can, you can practically tile your floor with them. And, and so what he's doing is he's standing from one to the other. And so the question is, does the ground force, the contact force, measured by the model, agree with the um, force of the, that the we thinks it is? And, and it, you could see very close, I think. In the U.S., we say close enough for government work. Here, now, don't you think that's like like it's it's? Good? And here, this is even nicer. Here, down here, I'm sorry for the colors, but this is the hand of God forces. So the 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 little external pitch and roll torques here are the the the, the things you have to compute to make keep this thing from falling over. But they're tiny in, in, in a parent's view, they're tiny, whereas the, these other things are huge. Here's where the, he's, he's translating, transitioning from one plate to another, you get these wild um, variations. But up here, very nice. But then, for instance, the, the difference there between computed and measured would be, let's say, a dozen newton or something like this, or this order, right? Yeah, the newton. So what would that translate to with respect to movement? So if I would drive, if I would put a torque on, let's say, the knee joint, and I would vary this with mm -hmm. 10 newtons, what would I do to the, to the rotation? I understood your question. Yeah, no, it's, we got it. No, I, I'm going to go answer it. But you can at least see in pantomime here that mm, he is sort of going. I mean, in the, in broad outline, he's he is he is, he is he, he's going from one plate to the other, and you don't have a lot of right. You don't have a lot of, but but. We have to answer. We, it, it's, we, I'm gonna, we'll do that. We're going to do that. It's a beautiful thing.
something I didn't understand uh, in relation to your passive walker, because you, you like the passive walker a lot, and it seemed to me that he didn't have any control of his joints, by, and, and yet here you're controlling all of the joints, so how do you... Kind of no, 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 no. Um, Okay, that's a good question, Kevin, because it, see, the, the thing is, there's three stages we can talk about. One is the fact that the, when you designed the system, you had to put in all those links, and you have to put, you have to put in the rotational degrees of freedom, and, you know, the, 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 you know, the, and some of these things are complicated, like shoulders are a mess. He spent a lot of time on the shoulder. And, but when you do that, you're basically making commitments about the possible movements that you can make. So that's the commitment. And then the, what the torques are around, okay, that's a degree, that's a, no, a number, you know, but that, the, if you add up all the bits you're spending on all your, all your parameters, you're way, 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 way under all the possible movements that you could make in principle with any skeleton, with any human design, a Martian or stuff like that. We take all the different designs of skeletons, that space is enormous compared to the, the particular movements we can make with a particular, and, and there's the people at Stanford are uh, working on problems like this and they say that the actual, they have a paper out, the actual musculature helps stabilize the skeleton. So the, it, which is, uh, pretty intuitive, but since the muscles are kind of stuck on the, the skeleton to begin with, you would think, yeah, they would keep it from moving around wildly. No, but my question is, what you seem to have done here is created a control system that gives the, you the correct torques at every instant so that the walker walks or does whatever he does. As though there was an active control of the, of the joint and of the torques for each joint. Whereas the passive walker is doing this without any control system. Yes. So, so, so it seems contradictory. This, this, this project here seems somehow contradictory with the passive walker. They didn't even have a control. They didn't need one. OK. Well, if it, the answer is, of course, that you didn't add too much. And you got something for it, because you can now can make turns and stuff and do you know, speed up and slow down where the passive walker is can do the one walk, it's a slinky. Well, why didn't you take the passive walker and add, add the controls on top of it instead of redoing the whole walk? See, I'm saying, Kevin, that we did that. That's what we did. OK, wait, wait, there is something coming at the end that may make you happy. <laughs> right? See if, see if Benny Dick was happy. No, he looks sort of in the middle somewhere. Okay, but uh, so I can use him as an example, but yeah. Question? Yeah. I, I didn't understand how the model parameters, the, the sort of moments of inertia, and the, yeah. the lengths, how, are they up? Do you optimize the model? No, you should do that, but you know, it, it, um, Joseph just dreamed them up. But just made, oh, he just made them up. Them and, oh, he's. Okay. He, he's okay. Because to, to get the correct joint, to infer the correct um, uh, uh, torques, you presumably would have to have the correct model parameters. Yeah. But presumably you could alter. You could. You could. Right, and if you want to come to Texas, you really could. Because, you know, but it, Joseph was just one person. He had to stop somewhere. But you, you, absolutely, you could do that. Yeah, and, and it should be done, and, and it would be a, a, a very pretty thing to do. OK. Um, so just, oh, how are we holding out? We're OK, right, time-wise? Uh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. We, I can do it. I can do it. Ready? Can I follow up with another question? Yeah. Presumably, if you optimized the, those model parameters and got the correct moments of inertia and length, then it would do the passive dynamics correctly. Yeah, it should. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Um, to be to be tested. Yeah, okay. All right. So this is like a hundred yard dash where the, you can see the tape and you just have to run as fast as you can. Ready? 
Okay, so th this is something we've done where we, in the virtual environment, you, you're wearing the suit, you touch those targets, and you can um, compute the total integrated torque that you used in touching those targets. And it's kind of cute because it shows that the targets, two is right out here, it's the cheapest one, and two is the cheapest one on the measurement. So it's just kind of a sanity check here. But the um, five through eight, you have to take a step, and so they're more expensive. So what we're excited about is now, for this kind of reinforcement learning approach, is now you can have the cost of a movement. So if, you're, if you, a person, are choosing movements based on their cost, we can check you out because we can measure what the cost of movement is. The other thing we have is EMG. So one thing jo Joseph Singh can't do is it can't do co-contraction because um, it only does net torque. But if we stick electrodes on you, um, then we can directly get an indication of the, of the muscle energy expenditure. And here's just a kind of another sanity check to see if the um, torques on the EMG uh, match up with the, with the um, integrated torques in the model. And they do, that basically Joseph's reaching for targets and, he, and, 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 and he, he has high and low reaches and on some of them he has 10 pounds on his, on his wrist. And so you can see that that's correlation um, 0.9. Okay, I'm telling you what this is. In the Stanford lab, they took um, motor cortex of a monkey and they jammed 100 electrodes on a plate in there and just measured whatever, whatever torque to them, they measured it. So they had 100, almost 180 dimensional signal coming out of there of neural firing patterns while a monkey was doing what? Monkey was had a, looking at a fixation target, and then a, a reach target uh, came on, and then he was given a go sign. He or she could point at the target. So, but here you're seeing what? Okay, what are you seeing here? They can take the the eighty dimensional vector that's evolving in time and do PCA on it and and give you the two uh, most prominent dimensions. And so you can see the pink one is the target onset happens and then the pink is the trajectory in motor space of all the neurons and then the go cue it starts the green and then there's all that trajectory and then the movement onset point. Right? And what's important about this is that the, um, the, the, the movement onset is usually where the optimal feedback control people come in. Right? But here, in this, most of the computation in motor um, cortex is preparatory. So maybe in, your, in, a fa in, in some fantasy, when the target comes on, you can solve the kinematics. And when the go cue comes on, then you can solve, um, dial in the dynamics. And off you go. I'm skipping over this. I'm skipping over this. I could actually skip over everything. Um, maybe one thing. So another graduate student did muscles. We need this, I guess did muscles. And so what, what about muscles? Um, here's some muscles attached to the leg and here's Casey again moving around. And isn't this beautiful? It's a deviation of those muscles from resting length. And it's like music. It's very, very beautiful. And, and so, um, wow, what you would think, you should code them with something. Um, let's pick Gabor functions and maybe we could vary some of their parameters. So, mm, we could, okay, you know what I'm doing, I'm varying parameters. So, um, and now, oh, we needed, we needed this formula at the top. So the idea is, your spinal cord has primitive pattern generator functions that you've already decided on. So for any movement that you want, for any muscle, you just have to take a linear combination of those. And so once I give you the linear combination, you can tell me what the entire movement sequence is. And here's a muscle for walking. That's one of the muscles in blue. And so we just pick out one of the pattern generators. Hmm, looks pretty close to me. And, and um, that's its coefficient down there. And ooh, let's pick out some more. Getting closer, very close. But this is, this is amazing because um, you got it like a handful, like 10 or 20 coefficients, 10 or 20 numbers. This is actually seconds here. 10 or 20 numbers in two seconds. So imagine how, how different that is it, in, instead of 10 to 40 kilohertz. Your bandwidth is on, it's, it's, it's achievable. But the other thing here, which is quite amazing, which really was 
kind of a rush for me when I finally realized it is I'm kind of a squash player. Probably not many people are squash players or racquetball players, American knuckle dragging game. But you know what it is, squash. Yep. Right? It's kind of like tennis, but there are walls and stuff. Okay. Which is why I played it, because I was never any good at tennis, because it didn't have walls. Um, <laughs> except for the King of England. <laughs> he had walls for his tennis court. Okay. We're running out of time. But the important thing is that um, when you make your squash stroke or your wreckable stroke, that the time, you have no time to control it en route. So it's like a saccade. You just, you have to fight, just fire and forget because the time that the movement takes is much too fast to actually um, send um, 10 hertz uh, um, controls down there. You have to compute the entire movement ahead of time. So those coefficients, even though they occur during the movement, have to be, says, says the reasoning, computed ahead of time in some movement preparation sense. So the, so the, the we we'll just have, go past this, Oh, mm, later if we need it, later if we need it, um, later if we need it. Here, um, here, this is the orthodoxy, right? I take you into the classical cathedral of or orbital frontal, um, of, of optimal um, control theory, optimal feedback control theory. And this is, here's your model and, and you have a state space and dynamic equations and all you have to do is find out how to map that onto your system and you're done. But I point out on this one, t equals zero is when the movement starts, right? And you saw in, in the Chinoy lab from Stanford, most of the computation is done before the movement starts. And so the question is, the, the, uh, my um, suggestion for you is that in human motor control, which is very different than robotic motion control, the movements have been computed before that in your lifetime. So in your lifetime, you've computed the movements and stored them and you're just looking them up. And so here we go. The skeleton um, gives you some of the basic mechanics. Another ab next abstraction is muscles tell helping you with stabilization. The next is the center, the pattern generators that give you motor primitives. If you get in trouble with load balancing, you've got a cerebellum. And then finally, if you want to um, compute your which movement to use, you have a, 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 a forebrain to do that, the, the cortex. And um, I think that's probably a good place to leave it. I'll just remind you of, of our lab again. This is slightly different people, but the, now the people with boxes around um, did the work. And there's Joseph Cooper standing at the back. And then there's Rahul Iyer is, is the, um, standing more to the front. And so Rahul Iyer did the coding of the muscles. And Joseph did the torque um, computation that you saw. Thank you. Okay. Thought it was like Mon Monica Sellers. I was about to be stabbed or something. Can I actually ask first question? So. Uh, I wonder about this gaze model in the car driving. So what kind of information is actually so it's model getting from the gaze? So we saw only it is gazing into a car, but does it see everything or? That's an important thing. So, so the, 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 it's the, the true answer to the question is it's an open problem. OK? However. Um, we can say some things about it. So certainly from the standpoint of the modules formulation, each module has very specific information that it needs, right? So if, you, if you're following the car, you know where, you want to know where the car is with respect to um, where you think it is, right? And if it's speedometer, you want to read kind of where that lever is compared to where um, you want it to be. And so though, if for each task, and, and the th suggestion is that vision is, Human vision is just like that. And you basically have, this is an idea of Ullman, has been around for a long time, of visual routines. So you have these primitive visual routines. And actually, the, the um, Rolsima 
has shown that there's, that there's evidence for visual routines in monkeys very dramatically in Amsterdam. But the, the, the idea is you, when you want to do these computations, it's a programming problem for your brain, and you have primitive routines that you can compose to do it, but each one is going to be special. But now, you might ask me, maybe your question is, here's the important question, that, part of what you asked, and that is, if, how, if what happens about an interrupt? I'm driving, things happen all the time. A drunk driver comes out, or somebody steps in front of the car. You, what do you do with in, interrupts? Right? And, and there, you hear the lure of saliency. Saliency is calling. If only you could, you could you know, continually process the image in terms of sailing things. So the, my counter um, proposal to that would be it's too expensive to do that. But what you might be able to do is you might be able to program the visual array with something like saliency but with respect to the task. So for, if for the driving task there are certain things you will about allow yourself to be erupt, uh, interrupted for. So you just have a big motion detector, or this detector, or that detector. You know, there's just certain things that could happen that, that would interrupt you. You know, and, and it's, but it has to be for it to work, for it to be technically possible. It has to be scalable, for, it has to be programmable for each individual sort of task suite. You know, so if you're in a construction site, you know, the dr after a while you won't even notice the jackhammer because it's not important, right, as long as you don't stick your fingers in there. You, you won't to, so that won't be important, but if you're in a hotel thing or a theater, especially in the U.S., and you hear gunfire, um, you know, that's very important. And, and, you know, and, and, and so you would, of course, um, only in the U.S. would you set your alarm system to, for gunfire, but um, but but you know that you have to. That's the technical problem. You have to somehow do that, and so it's kind of a, a, a little bit towards saliency. But you you still have to, in my view, you still have to take your task suite in order to make it work. Thanks. So I like the schema that you had on the slide next to this one, or before this one, very much with the hierarchy of the different levels of uh, movement control. And I was wondering if every movement goes through this hierarchy or if there are shortcuts. For example, if you learn, want to learn dancing or any other movement you have never done before, you probably don't have a central pattern generator for that. So is there a uh, possibility for the motor cortex, for example, to directly control the muscle? No, yeah, I, in my view, you're entirely right. But yeah, it, it's, it's not just about movement, it's about cognition in general. And so the, the deepest, in, you're close to, I, what I think is the deepest, uh, one of the deepest insights about brain computation you can have is that basically you, your forebrain is trying to automate everything. So if you have to pay attention to something that's very expensive, and you get something for it because some evidence suggests that that's the only way you can modify something by, by paying attention to it. But you really don't want to do that. You want to, you, you want, once you get a reward seeking um, program that's successful, you just want, you don't want to get out of the way. And, hmm. Um, and it, it, I'm, I'm going to forget the author on this, but, um, the author, every time an author dies, I rush and read their book. But there's Consider the Lobster. Um, maybe people have read that one. Forrest. Who was Forrest? David Forrest? Yeah. Okay. So, he, but he said, um, one of the chapters in Consider the Lobster is uh, Tracy Austin, how he, he, was, he wanted to be a tennis player himself. And it, is it Tracy Austin broke my heart? Yeah, so in that chapter, he says, they have all these athletes, you know, they do something spectacular and the, the reporters come around afterwards and say, well, how, you know, how are you doing? And, and, you know, and they all say something stupid like, for the team, or, you know, I don't know, some God made me do it. Or, but they have no, they're clueless about how they did it. And, and, and his point is that the audience watching that doesn't have the skill brings all this cognitive apparatus to the actual shooting, whereas the athletes, they have it down in the engine room. They, pay, they don't have to pay any cognitive access to it. And in fact, if they do pay active cognitive access, they can't do it because the overhead is so great. So they train themselves so that all the, auto, the, the things are automatic. The closest, I think, is every day, not as 
unathletic or relatively unathletic ordinary humans, uh, this experience we would have is in driving a car, where I don't know if you've, you've probably had this here, talking to a friend while driving a car and you're on a familiar route and then, you know, like miles and miles or kilometers and kilometers down, you all of a sudden pop out, you know, and you realize, oh no, you know, you have no memory of driving, you know, kilometers through city streets, nothing, you know, and I, I, I always panic. Did I hit something? You know, I always try to say, like, I would have heard the squish, you know, if I, I, I would have heard, I would have heard, if I, if I, you know, I would have heard something. And, but it's, you have this total, you have this total non-existence of what happened is because you drove on autopilot. It's not like you didn't do eye movements. You know, you need the eye movements. So it's just that you automate it. And so I think it's, your question is, it's like, the answer to your question is yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what Chris Kopp calls the zombie agents, right? Yeah, philosophy. Well, he, he didn't invent that term. That's philosophy, philosophy in, in as much as they have any technical hardware at all. Zombie is, a, is, is their thing. Is it? So any, any other questions, comments? If that's not the case, we're going to have a break uh, until 12 or maybe slightly longer. OK. Anyway, thanks for asking your questions. It really made things more fun for me. And, and they were spectacular questions. So, And have a good rest of the time.